Hello and welcome back to Wall Street Petting Zoo, your podcast for all things investing, trading, and finance related. I'm uh, Christopher Smith and I'm here with... Robert Coburn. And uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about, we're going to do a retrospective on this last week and the Fed meeting, among other things. And then we are going to... Shit, what are we talking about, Robert? <laughs> uh, we're just going to go over a couple little terms we went over last week. Uh, we didn't really fully explain um, long stock and then uh, short short selling of stocks. Uh, so we'll be going over that. And we'll also be going over next week's outlook as well as, uh, as you said, like the market's reaction to uh, the Fed cut this week. Oh, and we were going to talk about trading platforms, choosing a trading platform. Uh, that is also correct. Okay, so uh, let's get the vocab out of the way. Long on a stock is when you are expecting the stock to go up, and so you buy the stock in order to profit from upward moves in the price. And then short is when you expect a stock to go down and there are instruments that you can use options trading there are some inverse etfs that will allow you to actually profit from the market when the market is going down or when a particular security is going down so if you see a stock that looks really weak they've got weak fu fundamentals and they're really overvalued you can actually short that stock and then if that stock drops say 50 percent you can actually pick up a 50% gain on your investment, or in some cases, more than that. Anything to add, Robert? No, you, uh, you nailed those definitions. Okay, so let's go ahead and look back at the last week. Uh, in last week's episode, I predicted that the Fed was expected to cut rates by a quarter percent and to signal another quarter percent rate cut uh, sometime later this year. And I also predicted that if we didn't get that, if we only got like the quarter percent cut, but we didn't get a clear signal about a rate cut later this year, that we would see a sell off on Wednesday when the announcement was made. And then the market would come back up on Thursday and Friday. So we did, in fact, see a quarter percent rate cut without a clear signal about a rate cut later this year. In fact, uh, broadly speaking, traders are not expecting a rate cut later this year any longer. And so we did see a significant sell-off on Wednesday, but uh, it did come back up by the end of the day. So you had a midday sell-off and then a late-day recovery. Thursday, we were in the green. And then Friday, there were some other news factors that brought the market way down on Friday. Uh, we had um, uh, midday, there was an announcement that China had canceled a, a, a visit that its trade delegation was going to make to some American farms in Montana. And uh, traders broadly took that as a signal that China is maybe not as interested in the trade deal as uh, it had been previously. Donald Trump earlier that morning had tweeted that he didn't need a trade deal before the election. And uh, he also referred to China as America's number one enemy. And so China may have been retaliating against him by canceling those farm visits, uh, kind of playing some hardball and suggesting that the trade deal isn't that urgent for them either. So some, some sort of trading of insults probably between the leaders of the United States and China, which made traders a little bit pessimistic about the possibility of a trade deal uh, when talks happen next month. And so the market sold off, particularly tech stock was hit especially hard. Yeah, it's um, a bad day to own Roku stock, but that's oh yeah, that's, uh, in fact probably, I did own Roku stock. <laughs> that's probably unrelated to you know the Fed taking a cut this uh, this week, but man, they got hit hard. They got hit really hard. Twenty percent um, down. I actually on Thursday had bought some Roku stock at the end of the day. I managed to pick the biggest loser of Friday. Um, so I had seen that Roku was 25% off its high. Uh, it had reached 180 earlier this year, which was really great. Um, and then it plunged 25%. And I thought I saw that it was it looked like it was bouncing a little bit on Thursday. And so I went ahead and bought some at the end of the day. 
And then Friday morning, an analyst released a report that said that Roku basically maybe broke. Um, he suggested they may be in, in a really bad place financially. And so Roku started to sell off. And I saw that my Roku stock was down 6% that morning. I saw that the trading volume was really high. So there were a lot of people actively selling the stock and that it had gone below the low from the previous two days. Uh, so it was below the level that it had bounced from. And uh, I also saw what the news was and saw that it was really significant news. And so I dumped my Roku stock when it was down 6% from where I bought it. And then over the course of the day, it proceeded to lose a total of 19%. Yeah. So I saved myself a, a pretty good amount of money by getting out when I did. Its trade volume is 65 million, which is crazy high. That, that is huge. A million is a lot. Yeah, you know, a million like is most stocks it, yeah, are but trading somewhere like 250,000 million trade yeah. were traded. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, that's outrageous. But I mean, I I look at like their business model and they're competing with both Apple and Amazon and Apple and Amazon are kind of stepping on the gas and I haven't really seen Roku step on the gas cuz they only have the their own product offering is in direct competition. You know, I got the Fire Stick and then you got the Apple TV. You got two big competitors, and Roku's been uh, stagnant in that market. They haven't been innovating. Yeah, they're um, they they had announced the release of a bunch of new devices, which was part of the reason that I bought when I did on Thursday. They also had announced the launch of a streaming service. And streaming is a really competitive space as well. We've got, you know, Netflix in that space, obviously, is a huge dominant competitor, but lots of other services. Hulu is big, and we've got new entries coming in all the time. Um, Eros just launched a, a collaboration with Microsoft to do a streaming service. So just like lots and lots of competitors. Um, and Roku is not doing well in that space so far. They need to work um, on their marketing then because I didn't hear about any of that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, when they announced the the product launch, it actually sold off on Wednesday. Um, so traders may not have been very excited about that product launch. Um, and then it started to bounce back on Thursday. And I thought, OK, maybe we'll get a rally here on the strength of those product offerings. But then it sold off in a big way on Friday. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know the details of those products or why traders seem pessimistic about those products, but it doesn't seem like Roku is offering anything really new. You know, they're just uh, sort of upgrading more of the same. So anyway, uh, Roku may get a bounce from the, let's say, like 90 to 100 range. Um, I'm going to look again at entering it if it gets that low. Uh, right now it's at 108. Um, but I'll have to take a serious look at that analyst report and see how the company looks financially, see if they have cash flow issues, debt, that sort of thing. Because uh, if a company like that were to go out of business, you could lose your whole investment. Unless they get bought out by another company. That's right. That does happen. That wants to get their hardware and their, uh, their IP. Yeah, that's right. Um, anything else to say about the uh, previous week, Robert? Uh, banks won a lot this week. If you own bank stocks, uh, chances are your portfolio is green today. Yeah, and that is because banks actually benefit from higher interest rates. Uh, higher interest rates are profitable for banks. And so if we had gotten clear signals about you know further rate cuts or if we had gotten a bigger rate cut than expected, you would have seen banking stocks get hurt hard. Um, so investors are really bullish on banking stocks because we didn't get the rate cut that was expected. Um, one other thing that happened this week, Robert, actually a couple other things that happened this week. Um, sat Sunday, uh, Iran and the Houthi rebels apparently attacked the Saudi oil fields and blew up half of Saudi Arabia's uh, oil production capacity. And that means money for oil stocks. It does. It does. Oil prices I saw Sunday night were up 10%. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to wake up at uh, 2 a.m. tomorrow morning when the pre-market trading opens up 
and I'm going to buy some uh, leveraged oil funds. And so I did that, uh, got up in the morning, and I saw that the Velocity Shares oil uh, ETF was up 20% already when I logged in in the morning at 2 a.m. And uh, so I thought, okay, uh, I don't know if I want to buy it when it's up 20%, so I'll wait for a pullback. I bought a few shares at up 20%, but I set some some orders for lower prices, but it did not pull back, so I didn't get to buy any more. But the shares that I did buy were up 10% basically by the time I got up in the morning uh, from where they had been. So we gained a total basically of about almost 40% that day in these leveraged ETFs. So I did make a little profit on what I had bought. Um, I also had bought some gold funds when I woke up that morning because gold tends to do really well when there's fears of war. Um, altogether, I made about $160 on Monday. So even though I lost $60 in Roku on Friday, I was still pretty green for the week uh, because of the news on uh, Monday and the way that I was able to take advantage of that news. Very nice. So for those of you, uh, for those of you out there that don't know what pre-market is, uh, so there's a couple of hours, usually between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, for each trading day. Uh, you're able, there's basically like a pre-market trading session where, uh, you'll be able to make trades. Uh, there's not a lot of people that do trades or at least do small trades during those hours. It's usually like big, uh, big trades, uh, before the, the stock market opens. It's kind of like, uh, it's not like any type of sale or anything. It's just, uh, extra hours in which people can, uh, bid and purchase stocks and funds and that can also be done in after hours markets as well there's also uh i think it's a th is it a three hour window after the market closes uh, there's two hours after the market it's just two hours okay and then actually before market you get five and a half hours um but is depending on your trading platform you'll get different levels of access to that um, oh. So I, on Robinhood, I believe you get half an hour of pre-market access. Um, but if you use Webull, you can get the whole five and a half hours. Interesting. I didn't know that about Webull. Yeah. So one of the uh, things that happens, especially if you're in like leveraged funds that are super, super volatile, is that, you know, overnight that will move a lot in the pre-market session. Um, l during low volume periods, like the pre-market or the aftermarket, uh, just a few people buying or selling will move the stock quite a bit. And so um, those you may wake up and find that you've lost 10% of your investment. So it's really useful actually to have access to those pre-market and post-market sessions because you can see what the stock is doing after hours. And if you see like a major movement in the after hour session, that tells you maybe something significant has happened. You can look at the news and decide whether you want to stay in or get out. Um, and you can maybe cut your losses before it makes really, really big moves. Definitely helpful. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, trading platforms. Uh, what are you using these days, Robert? Uh, so I use two platforms. Uh, one I generally, I generally don't look at every day. Uh, so I use Fidelity as, uh, my, uh, main one and Fidelity still uses the traditional, uh, the traditional model of, you know, you buy when you, whenever you make a trade or so in other words, anytime you buy or sell a stock, uh, you're, you incurred a fee for making that trade, uh, versus more New, the newer platforms in the game like Robinhood and I'm not sure does Webull have uh, Webull is also commission free yeah so uh, Robinhood my, the one I use on a day to day basis that one does not have trade fees which is nice if you're buying uh, if you're new to stock trading it's a good thing to use because then you're not worrying about like let's say you buy a hundred dollars worth of stock and then on a traditional platform like Fidelity or Merrill Lynch, uh, if you use if you pay for a hundred dollars, you're actually paying a hundred and five just to get in, and then you have to pay an extra five to get out. 
So in other words, you have to at least make 10 extra dollars. So your investment has to go to 110 in order before you even make a profit versus Robinhood or Webull where there's no commissions. So in other words, you, as long as you go up a penny, you're still making money. Yeah, on a $100 trade, a $5 commission is 5%. That's really big. And you have to think about if you're holding that investment for 30 years, that 5% would have gotten maybe like 10% per year compounded. That's a pretty significant loss over the course of the next 30 years. Um, you're not just losing the $5, you're losing all of the gains on that $5. And if you add that up, like let's say you make 10, 20 trades when you're getting into the market, uh, that gets to be pretty significant. Now, does does Webull reinvest the dividends you get into the stock, or is it uh, just cash you out? It casts you out. Okay, it's just like Robinhood does. So, in right, exactly. in, in the traditional platforms, uh, what'll end up happening is you'll get like a percentage of a share. So you'll get uh, so for example, if it's uh, like a five percent dividend on like a hundred dollar stock, you'd get. Uh, one point at the end of the day, you'd have 1.05 shares of, of a stock instead of having one share and then an extra like $5 in your account. Interesting. I've not uh, received dividends on um, my Fidelity stuff, so I, I wasn't aware that it was doing that. I do know that mutual funds work that way. Um, and that's what I use Fidelity to invest in is mutual funds. So and on a mutual fund, all the dividends go basically into gains. And that's where the compound interest comes in. Cause then since you're not basically, it's like set it and forget it. Cause you don't have to go in and reinvest the money into the stock. You could potentially be in a, uh, fry situation from Futurama if you ever get frozen and, you know, <laughs> catapulted a thousand years in time and the business still exists. End up being super rich. That's right. That's right. If you uh, do cryonics and you happen to get revived 200 years from now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know the the commissions. I think that the commissions in general are really bad because, like I said, you've got that compounding cost. You want compounding gains, not compounding costs. But um, one nice thing about the commissions is. If you uh, put your money into the market and you're always tempted to buy or sell based on emotion and you're trying to prevent yourself from making those emotional decisions to get in and out of the market, um, those commissions can be a nice, uh, what do I want to say, like a nice deterrent to prevent you from making those emotional decisions. You're, you uh, maybe might rethink getting out of the market if it's going to cost you $5 to get out. So if you're looking for a little way to incentivize yourself to just leave your money alone, those commissions can be nice. Another thing to consider if you're doing like penny stock trading, it'll definitely uh, add on to the cost of the stock. It's more, it's less of 5% and more of like that could be, you know, 50 shares of that stock that you're investing could have gone to the, like the investment rather than the, the commission trade itself and you know 20 30 years ago when there was no online platforms it made sense to have commission fees so that way you know the stock traders who that was their job was to just you know get you your stock buy and sell your stock all the time they were there was like a physical person that did that and it made sense to you know they need money so it made sense at the time but now well you know with the online platforms and the the reduced cost it takes to run the platforms it's actually it's not beneficial anymore to actually have those trade fees and commission fees that's right and there still are a lot of financial advisors out there who will actively manage your money for you but what most of them are doing is they're just putting your money into a passive uh fund an s p 500 index fund and they're just leaving it there which you can easily do on your own through a platform like Robinhood or Webull. And the financial advisor is quite possibly going to charge you $100 a month to do that, which is outrageous. I mean, <laughs> that's that's way worse than paying a $5 commission, right? Um, so 
if you consider that compounded over 30 years, that's you know $1,200 a year. You figure you would have made 10% on that per year, so you would make like 120 in the first year, um, and then 130 in the second year, and compound it over time, that adds up to a whole lot of money um, that you're losing as a result of paying those fees. So I really don't think it's worth having a financial advisor unless, I mean, one thing about it is that a financial advisor has the psychology of trading down. So he's not going to be jumping in and out of the market based on emotion. Um, so if you're worried about, you know, your proclivity to make emotional decisions, having a financial advisor can be one way to prevent yourself from getting in there and touching your money. But I would say it's better to just put your money in and hide your password from yourself, have somebody hide your password from you, um, rather than pay a financial advisor those kinds of fees. Basically, unless you're investing like $100,000, it doesn't make any sense to pay a financial advisor that kind of money. Yeah, I would only recommend a financial advisor if you just come into a large sum of money and you're looking to just, you know, make a nest egg out of it and just kind of forget it. Yeah. Now, does uh, Weeble have any type of like referral program? So uh, for those that don't know, Robinhood uh, has a program set up where you can invite your friends or family members or whoever, your neighbor uh, your coworker to use Robin hood and in sending them an invite from the platform, you actually, uh, you get a free stock and they get a free stock. And now it's not a, for the most, most of the time you get like a stock, it's like Chesapeake energy or, uh, uh, GoPro, you know, it's stocks that are around like the $5 mark. But, uh, my father-in-law, he actually got, uh, a share of Microsoft stock. Oh and, uh, wow! That's when awesome. my wife invite, invited him to Robinhood, so does uh, does Weeble have any sort of a uh, referral program? Weeble does have a, a referral program. Uh, right now, they've got a thirty dollar gift card as their bonus for uh, referring a friend. Is there any re- so, like requirement? Like they have to like put money in the account or anything? I suspect there is. I think there is on Robinhood. Yeah, let's see what this says. Yeah, initial deposit of one hundred dollars or more. So if you get a friend to uh, put $100 into a Webull account, you get a $30 gift card and a free stock valued between eight and $1,000. Wait, so you get both? You get both. Oh, wow. <laughs> and now that's a limited time offer. So I think normally you'd only get a free stock, but on this special offer right now ending September 30th, you get both. I know with uh, Robinhood, you just have to sign up. You don't actually have to invest any money into the account. Oh, that's cool. I see when I signed up for Robinhood, you did have to put some money in the account, but maybe they've changed that. Yeah, they they've changed it. I've I think I've gotten about 12 free stocks, but all of them have been like Sprint, GoPro, <laughs> Chesapeake yeah. Energy. Well, that's really cool. Uh, maybe I'll have to refer you to Webull and get my $30 gift card. <laughs> Wait, do I get anything? Or is it just you? <laughs> I, I think it's just me. I, I don't I don't know if you get one or not. <laughs> I Actually, you know what? I think when I signed up, I did get a free stock from Webull. So you probably do. I know uh, with Robinhood, though, like you're limited to the amount of trades you can make to, per day. Uh, and that's trading the same stock like buying and selling the same stock in the same day. I think you're limited to five per day on uh, Robinhood. Those are the limitations. Oh, and uh, previous to that, the uh, the free stock that you get, I believe you have to hold it in your account for at least a week, and then you can't take the funds out from that free stock for at least 30 days. There are uh, some terms and conditions in terms of uh, the free stock that you get. Yeah, so with uh, with Robinhood, basically the way it works is that you have to have uh, $20,000 or more in order to day trade more than five times. So um, if you a day, a day trade is when you buy and sell the stock in the same day. So you can make as many trades as you want as long as you're not buying or selling the same stock within a 24-hour period. If you buy a stock and then sell it the same day, that's considered a day trade, and you can do that up to five times. Uh, in Robinhood um, before you uh, run up against that regulatory limit. And that's actually a limit by law. That's not a limit that Robinhood is imposing on you. 
Um, but if you put more than $20,000 in your account, then you can day trade as much as you want. The, the other thing is there's also an additional uh, limit that's calculated in terms of like percentage of how much money you have in your account. And I'm not sure exactly how that limit works, but I actually ran up against that limit at one point in Robinhood um, and it happened kind of invisibly. I wasn't expecting it. Uh, and my account ended up getting suspended for 60 days, which is why I switched to Webull. Um, so normally you can see in Robinhood if you're approaching that five trade limit, but there's this other limit that's kind of invisible. Um, I have not run up against any limits in Webull. They don't have a, a program to see when you're running up against those regulatory limits, so you just have to kind of keep track of it yourself. Um, and I don't know if anybody, I don't know if there's any kind of accountability on that in Webull. Um, so I'm not sure what would happen if you ran up against those regulatory limits in Webull. I didn't but, even know uh, there was regulatory limits. What's that? I said I didn't even know there was regulatory limits. Yeah, that's why Robinhood imposes those restrictions. I think basically the feds are trying to prevent you from making big mistakes if you're a small trader. They don't want you to lose all of your money <laughs> gambling on the stock market, basically. It's kind of like a restriction against gambling. Yeah, but if you wanted to gamble, you just do like FanDuel or, you know, online gambling. Right. There are definitely ways to do gambling, although, uh, you know, different states have different restrictions on those kinds of gambling as well. But, oh, that is true. Um, yeah, so uh, let's just talk a little bit more about some of the perks. We already mentioned uh, pre-market access. Robinhood does give you access to the two hours after market, uh, but you only get half an hour in the pre-market. Um, whereas Webull gives you access to the full pre-market and the full aftermarket. So that's one thing that's really nice about Webull uh, that I really like. Uh, one problem with Webull is that you don't have access to options trading, uh, which uh, I don't think I'll get into the details of options trading right now. We can talk about that in a later episode. Um, but options trading basically allows you to potentially make really, really large profits on relatively small movements of the stock, but you also, of course, can lose your whole investment um, if your options trade goes against you. Um, so it's high risk, high reward uh, style of trading. A lot of traders really like options, um, and options allow you to profit from a specific stock if the stock goes down. So if you want to short a stock, uh, as we defined earlier in the episode, you have to have access to options trading. And so uh, Robinhood allows you that. Webull doesn't support it yet, although they're working on it. A um, couple other things. Uh, Webull has some nice analytics tools. You can draw trend lines on the PC app in Webull uh, in order to track uh, how a stock is moving. Um, I don't believe you can do that on Robinhood. At least you couldn't do that on Robinhood when I was using it a couple months ago. Um, Robinhood has just added a new feature called a trailing stop loss, which is kind of cool. So normally a stop loss order, you would set um, a price that you, if it hits that price, then your, your stock gets sold. So let's say the stock is at $12, and if it hits 11 then I want to get out because I'm afraid that it's going to go down further than that. So um, I would set a stop loss order for $11. A trailing stop loss order lets me say, OK, the stock is at $12. Um, I want to go basically whatever the highest price it hits, I want to set my stop loss at a dollar below that. So if the stock goes up to $13, my stock, my stop loss will now be 12 if it goes up to $14, my stop loss is now 13 and this happens automatically. So if I set up a stop loss for, you know, let, let's say 1% below the stock price and then the stock moves up 10%, then it comes down a couple percent, I'm going to basically exit when it's up 9%. Um, so it's a nice way to sort of uh, make sure that if the stock is moving up, but you want to get out, if you're just trading the trend, you want to get out um, as soon as it starts to come down, a trailing stop loss is a really nice way to do that. But the danger of it is that if there's a lot of volatility, like let's say it's spiking up and down really fast, um, you may get stopped out pretty quickly. 
So you have to basically allow the stock some breathing room for sort of little small fluctuations throughout the day with that trailing stop loss. Uh, so it's a nice tool to trade a trend, um, but it's really only something that a day trader would use. It's obviously not something that a buy and hold investor like yourself would use, Robert. Yeah. Uh, but Webull doesn't have that trailing stop loss feature either. That's a, another thing that they're working on. Um, one nice thing about Webull is they have what's called a paper trade account, which is basically a, a trading simulator that lets you uh, kind of use monopoly money, use play money to get in and out of the market. Um, it's not fully equipped, so you can't use things like stop losses. Um, you you can use uh, limit orders, which is um, you know if a stock uh, gets down to a certain price, then you would buy. So a limit order is what you would do use to try to get the best price on a stock. So you can do that in the paper trade account, but it's not it's not uh, fully equipped, so you don't have as many tools for paper trade as you would for trading real money. But it's a nice way to just kind of use some play money to experiment a little bit with some different trading strategies, see what works, what doesn't, without actually putting any of your real money at risk. So I actually, for beginning investors, would highly recommend paper trading. And uh, Webull is a great platform to do that on. Um, they also sometimes uh, have a trading competition where basically you will have a week to, they'll give you $10,000 of play money and uh, there are certain restrictions. You can only trade like high value stocks, so you can't, or high volume stocks, so you can't use uh, penny stocks. Um, and you also can only have a third of your account invested in one stock at any particular time. So you're basically, you can't win the competition just by like placing an all in bet on one penny stock, you know? Um, that's what they're trying to prevent. They're trying to make sure that everybody is playing in a well balanced way uh, with a diversified portfolio. And it's a competition to see sort of who um, it can make the most money in a week. And there are some traders on there who are pretty consistently making 15, 20% in a week. Um, they're few and far between, but there are some. And they will comment and post about you know, what trading strategies they're using, what stocks they're playing. So that paper trade competition is kind of a nice way to get some, some community support, to learn from other traders, to sort of compare yourself to other traders and see how you're doing relative to them. Um, it, it's a nice way to kind of gauge where you're at, um, help your, prevent yourself from getting too cocky, uh, but also to learn some really cool stuff from some really t talented traders. So um, I think that that's a, a really cool thing to do. And if you do really well in that paper trading competition, you can actually make some money. They, they give out gift cards, I think, for Lowe's um, based on sort of how much you've made in the course of a week. Sounds like a good way to uh, recruit hedge fund managers, <laughs> like hedge fund managers, like uh, the people who manage people's stock portfolios. Like, oh yeah, absolutely. If you were you a hedge find fund manager and you went on there and just saw who's sort of consistently winning, yeah. uh, it, snap that person up. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like a good way to like pad your like. It's just like it's just, that's like a cover letter for someone. It's just get get you in the door somewhere if you're uh, able to consistently do well. You totally could use it that way. Yeah. In the uh, the main paper trading account on Webull. Um, which is not associated with the competition. You basically have a million dollars uh, to play with, and <laughs> so you can make some really big trades. And but it shows you your performance over the course of however whatever amount of time you want to look at. So like let's say you do paper trading for a year, you can totally use that as your resume. You could just open up your Webull app and show the head fund manager, look, I made you know eighty percent in a year. Um, on all these different trades and you can see exactly which trades went for you and which trades went against you, how much you made on each one. Um, so you could really break it down and, and show them your skills. How, uh, are you able to have like multiple paper accounts? Like, uh, like let's say if we were to do like a competition between me and you to see like how much we would, uh, make in a year. Based no, on you only that. get the one paper account. I only get the one. Um, but they're so the competitions are all separate paper accounts. So, you know, you and I could do one of the week competitions um, and then the next week it basically would reboot us and we could uh, do it again. Start fresh. And See, that would benefit you, though. You're a short term trader. I'm long term. <laughs> well, I mean, you could buy at the beginning of the week and hold for the week and see how it does, uh, you know, while I do my day trading. So. 
you could still sort of compare the strategies, but it would be over a very short time frame. About that compound interest, man. <laughs> yep, that's right. So um, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I should say about those trading platforms. Uh, I think they're both really good trading platforms. You know, Webull has the community support. Um, but Robinhood has a few more features. So both both really excellent platforms, though. Yeah, the, uh, the more traditional ones, they've kind of modernized a little bit. Like uh, Fidelity, for example, you can uh, set up triggers so that way uh, if a stock goes to a certain value, like a, if you're looking at you know FedEx, uh, which right now isn't doing too hot, uh, but if you set it to like 125, the stock's at 148 right now. So if you set it to 125, you could set it so you either get like a text message, you get a, you know, an email, uh, or get a, like a push notification to your phone where it says, you know, hey, the, you know, the stock you've been looking at is finally at the value that you want. So you can go in and uh, execute a trade on that. You can also uh, set it. Uh, the trade just like in Robinhood and I believe it's also a, a feature in Webull where you could say you know buy this stock at this value and don't close this trade leave it open for X amount of days I think the furthest out you could do is what 90 days um, I'm not sure I, I haven't used that feature so I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah you so you're able to like leave trades open for uh, more than a day so you can leave it out open for I, I believe it's up to 90 days it might be longer um, but you're basically oh, you're talking about leaving a limit order open for 90 days yeah oh, okay yeah yeah limit order I guess that's a better way to that's the proper way to to explain it yeah so a limit order is basically you say that I only will, I will only pay this much for this stock and not a penny more although not a penny less uh, so it could bite you and bite you, uh, in the rear if, uh, the stock spikes and then, uh, goes back down as soon as you buy it at like a certain value. Yeah, that's right. Um, but yeah, a limit order, if the stock, like, let's say the stock is at $10 right now. And I say, I want to buy the stock if it hits $5, cause that's a critical support level. Um, if the stock falls to $5, then your limit order will execute and you'll get the stock at $5 a share. And then, you know, even if it was only there for a couple seconds and then immediately spikes back up to $6, you got that $5 price. So it's a really nice way to take advantage of like spikes down in stock price um, because you can't execute a market order with your fat fingers that fast <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know sometimes the stock moves so fast that you can't do it as a human so you've got to set up that limit order ahead of time in order to take advantage of that that big move that I, happens I, really fast i call that kind of trading macro training macro trading is it macro like, trading yeah because in like video games you set up macros to do <sighs> things quick for you you don't have to yeah. do it individually i call it macro trading yeah, yeah, I've I've used that to great effect. In fact, this week, um, when uh, the semiconductor fund spiked down on Friday really hard because of the um, the news about China's trading delegation canceling its visits to the farms, I set a limit order for like one seventy one or something like that, like a really really low level, and the the fund spiked down really fast. And then it spiked back up really fast. And so I got that 171 and then I got out at like 173 or something fairly quickly and made a couple percent on that trade within the space of just a couple minutes using limit orders. Um, so it can be a really nice way if the stock is just like wildly swinging up and down. It can be a nice way to make sure that you get like a really low price and then exit at a really high price within a short period of time. So it's a, it's a nice tool for day traders. Um, the, so the other thing that I'll say about Webull and Robinhood is that Webull has some really great analytics tools. Um, you can set up alerts in Webull just like you do in Fidelity. Um, so you will get alerts on your phone if stocks hit a certain price or if they move up a certain percentage or whatever. You can do that on Webull. Um, you also can, uh, like I said, do a little bit of charting. You can draw the trend lines. You can draw things on the stock chart 
look at it as a line or as a bar. You can look at you know volume and some different metrics, moving averages and stuff on Webull. Uh, you don't have access to those same kinds of analytics tools on Robinhood, or at least you didn't when I was using it. Um, I'm not sure what it looks like these days. But um, another really nice thing that Webull does is um, it's got a tool to show you news. So if a stock, like let's say you look at the, the list of the biggest movers, you can click on each of those and basically see immediately, is it just moving because you know traders are following the trend and there's not actually anything happening, there's no news moving the stock, or is there a big news event that's moving the stock? And you can see that instantly on Webull. They've got a little, little flag at the top of the page that will tell you you know, in very brief summary, what is the headline that's moving this stock today, if there is one. Um, so it's a great way to kind of assess the news very quickly and see what's going on with the stock. Now, is there a uh, desktop uh, view of Webull or is it uh, just app view? Because I know Robinhood, uh, they said that they were working on like a desktop version, but uh, that was like a year and a half ago and still today there is not one versus like the traditional platforms which do have desktop views yeah so uh Robinhood does have a browser view um so you can do it on a desktop i i used um desktop to trade in Robinhood for a little while um webull has a desktop app but you can't actually execute trades in the desktop app so the desktop app is actually really limited compared to the the mobile app um, you also can't access like community stuff or like the paper trading competitions or the um, you know conversations that are happening in the app. You can't do any of that on the desktop app. But the charting you can only do on the desktop app. You can't do it in the mobile app. So you know <laughs> you have to kind of combine the two if you want to do charting. But um, for for most purposes, I just stick to the mobile app with Webull because it's got way 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 more features than the uh, the desktop app. And I do all of my charting on a uh, website called TradingView that has a really nice suite of analytics fi features. Um, so I don't use uh, the Webull desktop app really much at all. Um, one nice thing, though, about the Webull desktop app versus TradingView, TradingView has a limitation where with like penny stocks, low volume stocks, you may not get up to the minute price information. Um, their their price information sometimes lags a little bit behind the market for like really low volume stocks. But in the Webull desktop app, you're going to get pretty much up to the minute pricing information. So you can see what the stock is doing in real time, uh, which is pretty nice sometimes for trading like big swings in penny stocks if you're a day trader. I don't I don't trade penny stocks a lot, but I know some people who have done that to great effect in Webull. They basically just trade the trend, and then as soon as it breaks a trend line, they exit that, and uh, you can see that in real time in Webull in the uh, desktop app. So it, it's really got a quite a nice suite of features. I actually um, am kind of glad that Robinhood forced me out with the 60-day account restriction because uh, if they hadn't done that, I would have just stayed complacent and stayed in Robinhood. And I'm actually much happier in Webull. I've learned so much from the, the trading community there. And um, I, it's great to have access to all of their analytics features. So um, I actually would highly recommend it for uh, people who are just getting into trading. I think it's a great option. I would definitely have to take that invite for the uh, <laughs> free, uh, free stocks. Yeah, I'll send you one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, anything else that you want to say about uh, trading platforms, Robert? Uh, not really. I mean, we covered pretty much uh, like the pros and cons of the uh, like the modern ones. I mean, we didn't really go in depth on the little bit more traditional ones, but I mean, the I feel like the more traditional ones are not suited for like the the newer audiences because uh, they're not as easy to digest the information. Uh, also, there's a lot. Of more nuances in like the traditional platforms versus like the uh, more modern ones that just go over your head because you're just so overwhelmed. You know, one thing that I do want to say um, about Fidelity is uh, Fidelity will give you access to tax advantaged forms of accounts uh, like IRAs and 401ks, um, whereas you can't do that in Webull or Robinhood. 
So the nice thing about like an IRA, for instance, a Roth IRA is um, you can basically uh, open a kind of account that you can't take money out over the next 20 years until you retire. But once you hit that retirement age, you can pull your money out basically tax free. Um, <clears throat> you can either pay all the tax on it up front or you can wait until you pull it out to pay the tax. Um, Either way, uh, you know, you get some tax benefit from having one of those accounts, but particularly the one where you get taxed at the end is really nice because um, basically when you put your money in, it's tax free. So you're going to get more compounded returns on uh, the money that you have in that account over the next 20 years. And then by paying the taxes at the end, uh, you're basically getting more return over the course of those 20 years. Um, so it's a really nice way to uh, get some tax benefits. And if you are using Robinhood or Webull, you're not going to get those tax benefits. Now, there's a limit to how much you can put into those tax advantaged accounts every year. So I actually have a Fidelity account and I put in, you know, $3,500 a year or whatever the limit is. Um, and then I trade the rest of my money on Webull. Um, so I think it's useful to have a Fidelity account for the purpose of having access to those tax advantaged accounts. The other thing that's really nice about Fidelity is uh, they have some really nice analytics tools. So if you go to their research section on their website uh, they and then go to stocks, they have uh, compiled basically the opinions of all of the different analytics firms. So you can go in and look and see a summary score, what they call their uh, equity star mine summary score. Basically a score out of 10 that combines the assessment of all of the different analytics agencies into a single score. And it's weighted according to which of the firms have the best track record in the market. So Zaxx, for instance, has a great track record on calling which stocks are gonna go up and which stocks are gonna go down. Whereas some of the other ones are actually uh, doing worse than the market in terms of calling which stocks are going to go up and which stocks are going to go down. So the Fidelity summary score is going to weight Zaxx's recommendation more than some of those other firms that are not doing as well uh, in predicting the market. And so it's a great way to see at a glance, you know, which stocks are really financially healthy, which stocks have serious problems. Um, so. <clears throat> this is what uh, we call fundamental analysis. Um, you know, how financially healthy is a company versus technical analysis where you're just looking at the chart and trying to predict based on moving averages and stuff how the stock will move. Um, the, the analytics firms are going to tell you what the fundamentals of the company look like. So I can go in and look at Roku stock. And actually, if I had done my due diligence on Roku, Robert, I wouldn't have bought it because... It didn't have a good analyst rating <clears throat> on um, Fidelity. And if you scroll down on the Fidelity page for Roku, you can see that uh, it's still like vastly overvalued. There's this section on Fidelity that has the S&P capital IQ assessment of the company's financial health. So they have a score out of 100. What is its financial health? What is the overall quality of the stock? Um, you know, what is it overvalued or undervalued? They'll tell you out of 100 how overvalued is it, how undervalued is it. And uh, Roku, when I bought it, was something like, you know, it was really overvalued still, even though it had come down 25% off its highs. So if I had done my due diligence before I bought that stock, if I had looked at the Fidelity page, I would have seen this is a really overvalued stock. This is still not actually a good value. And I wouldn't have bought it. So um, that's a, a great thing to do before you buy any stock is look at, you know, the fidelity ratings, see what it looks like. Yeah, definitely uh, research before you buy. It's not typically a good idea to uh, invest with your heart unless uh, you have a very <laughs> lucky heart in which uh, probably should play the lottery. <laughs> That's right. I, I did do a little bit of research. You know, I looked at the news. I looked at the technical levels. I saw that it was a like a technical support level, but I, I didn't do the the uh, the fidelity check, which I usually do uh, before I buy a stock. I just uh, got lazy this time and I didn't do that, and I paid for it. So, really, really useful tools over there at Fidelity. Even if you're not going to open one of those tax advantaged accounts and you're not going to actually 
put any money into Fidelity, it's still worth having a Fidelity account just to have access to all of those analytics and research tools. Is there a minimum requirement for uh, for Fidelity? I think you can just open a Fidelity account. I don't think you even have to have any money in it um, when you start out. But there is a minimum for, I think if you open like an IRA, I think you have to put in like at least $1,000 into your IRA or something like that. Yeah. And just keep in mind when you're signing up for any of these accounts, you do have to sign up with your uh, social security number. This is for tax purposes. Uh, and this is also to make sure, you know, you don't make more than one account. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, what, uh, you got any thoughts about the, the week ahead and what we might uh, see this week, Robert? Well, we def we have, I have, uh, four stocks that I'm going to be looking at this week, uh, that are announcing earnings. Uh, we have Adobe, FedEx, General Mills, and Herman Miller, uh, those those four uh, to me are like the biggest stocks that are announcing earnings now. FedEx recently took a hit because uh, for one uh, they announced that they're ending their uh, partnership with uh, Amazon. Which, from my personal experience, anytime I got a package delivered via Amazon and it was uh, mailed via FedEx, it like it was like a twenty five percent chance I'd get it. Like it was not a good. Uh, partnership I think between Amazon and FedEx I think there was a lot of miscommunication at least from my perspective uh, and the fact that they uh, announced that they're cutting ties with each other it kind of confirms that in my mind um, but we'll con- uh, we'll see how their earnings go now that they're in a post I don't know, remember when exactly they're ending their Amazon partnership but uh, we'll see how the stock goes for in a post Amazon world for uh, FedEx they are gonna hurt so bad yeah especially well especially if Amazon goes through with their plan of having their own mailing service uh, or their own uh, shipping and receiving I mean I don't foresee them ending their partnership with uh, like UPS anytime soon because UPS actually delivers correctly uh, <laughs> my, and I and I don't mean that like FedEx doesn't deliver stuff correctly overall. Like we, I, I've used FedEx uh, in many businesses and had that almost zero problems with them in the business world. But it seems like in the uh, consumer space, they're not really well suited for that. Yeah. But uh, so you said you had four stocks you were watching. You yeah. mentioned FedEx. What else? Uh, General Mills. General Mills has been uh, basically doing very well over the last like year. They've been they're up almost twenty points. Oh, well, not twenty points. Uh, like about uh, fifteen, fifteen points uh, year to date uh, over the year. They, I mean, they did have a small dip right at the end of last year, but I mean, most most stocks do have a dip of about you know. Uh, five to ten percent at the end of the year because everyone's trying to like sell off their stock um but i mean overall they're not back to where they were back in uh 2016 when they were at like an all-time high i think it was like 72 uh so i mean i don't i don't foresee them doing terribly and probably i'd say it might be going up to like 60 by the end of the year or at least before the before December, before the stock starts to dip again. Uh, Herman Miller, uh, that one is kind of shaky. That one just kind of goes up and down. It's very volatile. Like it'll, uh, although if you do exploit the trend lines on that one, you could, as a day trader, make uh, quite a bit of money on that. Because uh, if you look at like the, the last year to date, it's kind of, you know, you look at the chart, it's just going up and down, up and down, up and down r- rapidly. So it looks like each day it goes up and the next day it goes down, next day it goes up, next day it goes down. So it's good for day trading. I'll have to look at that because that's the kind of stock I like to trade. <laughs> yeah, it's good for day traders. For, you know, long traders like me, it doesn't really matter. We look at the, the long trend line, not the short one. All right, so is that all of yours? Yep. 
so the ones that I'm watching, um, we did just yesterday get announcement that the U.S. is going to send troops into Iran. And so this week, I think we will see gold pop as a result of uh, war fears. Gold tends to do really well. So there's a fund called the Junior Gold Miners Fund. It's a leveraged fund, so it tries to gain three times the movement of the gold mining stocks, uh, particularly the small cap gold mining stocks. And so this is definitely like when gold moves, this moves a lot faster. This is the biggest way to profit from relatively small moves in the price of gold. So I trade this one a lot. Um, and I think that this week, between the Fed rate cut and um, sending troops into Iran, I think that this one is going to move up quite a bit. Um, gold is at kind of it's it's down a little bit. It's at a, you know near a support level, um, and it's got some room to run up to its recent high. Uh, so I think that you know that's going to be a profitable trade this week. There's also a, a fund that's defense and aerospace. Uh, this is also a leveraged fund. Its biggest holding is Boeing, which has a lot of uh, you know multi-million dollar drone contracts with the U.S. government, provides the U.S. government with a lot of jets and uh, fighter aircraft. Um, and I think it, it's also got some other companies that have defense contracts. And so I think that that one probably is going to move uh, upward this week. It's been hovering right around its all-time high uh, at 64.50. Um, it's broken above that high a couple times, but not on any kind of volume, and it's quickly pulled back from that level. It's gotten rejected from that all-time high a couple times. Um, but I think this week, with the U.S. sending troops into Iran, that's going to pop above its all-time high, and it's going to keep moving upward. So I suspect that we will see new highs in that one this week, uh, just based on the news. Um, a couple other things that I'm watching, uh, Kuru Sushi is a recent IPO. Um, went up quite a bit and then pulled back. It's now at uh, an all-time low, but we got a lot of volume on Friday when it pushed between b below its uh, previous low. Um, and high volume uh, days like that tend to signal a reversal in the movement of the stock price. So I suspect next week that one will pop up a, a little bit. Um, so I bought some of that on Friday. Um, Microsoft right now... Um, is a highly rated stock. There's a lot of interest in it. It's kind of trending on social media. So I think that we will see some moves upward in Microsoft next week. And then Microsoft also announced a partnership with a company called Eros. Um, Eros is a small cap stock. It's meaning it's a you know very cheap, uh, low price stock. Um, Fidelity rates it as undervalued, which means that uh, it's cheap to buy for how financially healthy the company is. Eros also has recently signed a bunch of collaboration agreements with um, other companies and governments. So it's had you know an amazing flood of contracts coming in, which tells me that they've got a really great product um, and that there's more room to grow for Eros. So I think that Eros is going to continue moving upward. It moved upward quite a bit this week. Um, but I think that it will continue to move upward. Right now, it's got a nice support right around $3. It's $3.03 right now. So I bought some of that on Friday, and I think that we'll see probably a nice move upward, maybe to the 350 range this week. So those are the ones I'm watching. I um, did not know that Kura Sushi was a, had its own stock. That's interesting. It does, yeah. It, this have you, was have just you been, recently, have I think. Have you been to any of their like restaurants? What's that? Have you been to their restaurants? I have not. Uh, for those that don't know, and I'm, well, it, it's kind of a tangent, but not really a tangent. Uh, Go ahead. these restaurants, it's like a, it's a basically a sushi boat restaurant, but it's not, they're not on boats anymore. There's just a conveyor belt. Uh, the menu is digital and you can actually order your sushi from a touchpad. And what it does is it'll actually come out onto a conveyor belt and go straight to your table. Uh, additionally, if, and they, they come out on these plates and these plates, if you get enough of these plates, uh, you basically feed the plate into a, a receptacle that if you turn in, I think it's like 10 or 15 plates, uh, you play, get to play a game and you get a prize. Like it's, it's a super interactive restaurant and uh, it's always busy. Like it's, it, there's always a wait. They don't have uh, 
they don't have any type of reservation system. You, it's all, like, it's like just super busy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, and in my opinion, this is one of the better recent IPOs. We've had a lot of flops this year on the IPO front, but uh, but this one seems pretty solid. So, yeah, I saw that it had hit a new all time low, and I thought, okay, uh, it's a good time to pick some up at a at a discount. So, we'll see what happens. All right, Robert. Well, that's it for today. I think we covered some great material, and uh, thanks to all you YouTube listeners out there for uh, checking in with the Wall Street Petting Zoo. Yeah, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Leave a comment below. Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. You can find that information in the description below. And uh, see you at the zoo next week.